So it turns out that when an ignition switch fails on a 300D, you can't start it, obviously, but you also can't really move the car. And when you arrive with the tow truck the next morning, you might find that an entire farmer's market has formed around the car and you have to wait another six hours to pick it up. I wasn't really sure how I was going to handle this one. I ended up just splurging and ordering a new switch from Kent Bergsma at Mercedes Source, and that came with all the instructions you need to remove and install one of these. I have to say that one PDF is well worth the 20 bucks off of his website because there's so much knowledge in there, so many details that you're just going to fumble around for days trying to figure it out unless you have this kind of insider knowledge about how these locks work. In my case, the tumbler lock failed, but also the shaft on the other side of it that rotates the actual ignition switch, that broke. So nothing was happening when I was trying to turn that key. Even when I took the tumbler out, it wasn't, nothing was happening. So the first task was to swap the old ignition buzzer and the actual switch part from the old lock to the new one. I, I, I took it out of the car. There's a lot of videos about taking it out of the car and how that's done, and I'm not gonna dig into that. But um, this is the new switch, and um, there's this ignition buzzer. I think it's like a, a contact for the buzzer, which goes in this kind of channel. This is where that I have to take that switch out of there and put it into the new, um, you know, switch housing or the the new steering lock housing. So when you turn the key, this slider pushes up, um, and then when you when you pull out the key, it like snaps back, and that's also part of the steering lock. This this pin slides back and engages with the steering lock, but this slider is what pushes a little pin. I cannot figure this out. I'm pushing it from the back, back here. There we go, now it's out. Wow, it's just a fragile little, fragile little switch. This little round boss there is going to slide into that and just push it in. Oh, there we go. It was not seated all the way home. All right, so that works. Okay, so here on the workbench, this is pretty much ready to go. I, I found another four millimeter metric fastener to uh, complete this trio of screws that holds this switch on. I think between the pop metal uh, shaft that interlocks with this switch and the fact that one of those fasteners was missing, I wonder if it got off axis just a little and that's what contributed to the failure, but um, this little switch is on. I have the vacuum, the rubber connector on the bottom and no rubber connector on the top because that's on the other line inside the car. That's why, that's how I know which one is which. But um, I, this is, you know, this is a really nice thing from Kent Bergsma. Uh, it's all lubed up and clean and, and by the way, uh, if you're, if you're trying to remove this, I hope I don't have to remove this key and tumbler. I'm trying to install it without removing that, but if there's anybody who thinks you can get like a coat hanger wire in there is totally off, you know, out of their, out of their mind. But um, that's about the size of what you want to be inserting there if you want to release that little pad that allows this to switch, to turn. Uh, I don't want to do that right now because I really buggered up this one. Uh, getting it off. It just would not move unless I really torqued on it and um, it continued to catch as I removed it around and around and around. But um, let's go take this in the car and see how we do. Okay, so I, I turned it on accessory. I depressed that little pin and then I turned it, turned the key back off and now that little pin stays in. So.
I think if I drop that steering column just a little bit more, and it'll come down just a little bit more. I won't have to mess with the dash. I won't have to, uh, I won't have to take out the steering column. I just wanna, I think it's these two bolts. I don't know why, but it's not really coming out. Loosening those bolts down there was just enough flexibility, I hope, that I can set this in there and get that pin to snap in place. Okay, this is, the pin finally made its way in. I, I think it's, it's maybe one of the details is, you need to find something, it, just this tape crumpled up under here was enough to keep that clamp out of the way while you're trying to see that pin. Um, that was handy. The other thing is, if you turn the key to a, to accessory, it will push the pin in, but things are not, you're going to be wrestling with this and pushing and pulling so that you need to pull that key out eventually. When Once this thing is driven into the shaft, once the, you know, the long body of it is um, inside that retainer there, that's the only time that you're gonna even hope to get the pin to pop into the hole. So you might as well just take the key out once you've once it's in that sleeve. The steering wheel shaft has to be pulled all the way up to get the angle right to get that to happen. So unfortunately it was not caught on film. The other thing I will say is that um, taking these nuts off of here I don't know if loosening this did anything, but um, I think that loosening it from this flange gave it just a little bit more downward angle of the entire steering column so that this, this was inserted into its hole, but you could actually drop the column enough that, that the end, the lock end of it, would be able to insert into the the sleeve and finally get it to be in position. Then you can push that steering column up and then start fiddling with that pin. I gotta say the temptation to start the car and see if it all works right now is powerful. <laughs> and But I just realized that this oil sender is something that would definitely cause a problem if I started the car right now. We're going to talk about gluing this back, this faceplate back on. The reason it comes off is because I'm not, 
I'm not using the special tool to get behind to get behind it, which is basically a coat hanger with a little bend in the end. To draw it out, I'm pulling on the faceplate, which when people do that, and I'm one of those people, this will tend to separate. And uh, the glue that I've used, I was using like a, you know, two-part epoxy. I was thinking, oh, I'll use uh, this 3M structural adhesive, which is very strong. Thinking, oh, maybe I should do something that's a little more, a little less brittle, so it doesn't snap. I was thinking maybe I'll do weather strip adhesive, but when I was at the model shop, I was getting this orange so I could paint the needles on the the gauges. I'm gonna see how that works out. But they had this uh, cyanoacrylic glue. One of them is called Instaflex, and the other one is called IC2000. This is this kind of rubberized uh, this is basically the uh, Black Max type cyanoacrylic glue, and Black Max is very expensive. This is, I think, probably just as good, and it's much, much cheaper. These are uh, 11 and 12 bucks at the local hobby shop, and uh, so I think I'm going to give this one a try. Or I'm going to test each, each of these and see which one I think is more appropriate for this application. Well, I was looking for the right kind of orange uh, to paint these needles, and first I got this fluorescent orange, which the cap looks okay, but when it comes out, it's just so intense, it doesn't feel right. So then I went back to the hobby store and I got this orange, which looks great on the cap, but this is the color that's inside. So I'm looking for, this is probably the needle that's the least faded. Looking for something that's like an orange like that. So I don't know, I or maybe something closer to the yellow. And neither of these make me happy, so. Just so orange. Obviously, I changed my mind and I did the needles with that fluorescent orange. Uh, I think it's a little heavy, uh, but maybe it's uh, very close to what was there in the factory. This is PS24 fluorescent orange from Tamiya. It's flat, 
which I love. Um, in terms of the the glue to hold the front face on, I did use this. Um, it's called Instaflex. I think this is just being re relabeled, but you can find this stuff on Amazon. Uh, but I didn't use the Black Max, the IC2000 stuff. I thought this was a more appropriate. It, it sets faster, it just made me happier. I would also say having denatured alcohol around, you can't get this in California anymore, so I'm like hoarding what little I have left, but it's really handy for doing that cleanup of the overspray, just a little tiny bit on a Q-tip. This is pretty good stuff. Um, this kind of polo, polio, polydiki, polydiki dust cleaning gel. It's uh, it's pretty nice because I think the the um, the vehicle that keeps it kind of wet is uh, is very close to alcohol. So even even in this very delicate flat black interior of that instrument panel, instrument cluster. Um, if you were like dabbing it on that flat black surface, it just picks up the dust and it doesn't really affect the, um, uh, doesn't affect the finish. So I still, I have a little tiny bit of overspray in there, uh, but it's, it's pretty clean. It's a 30 or 40 year old car and that's the 40 year old instrument cluster. So I'm going to go put this back in the car now. Okay, I took it out of the car again. <clears throat> actually had it working, the car running. I really don't know what happened with this, like... I want it to look good, <laughs> and it's this is just looking terrible, so I'm going to try to figure out if I can clean that up. I think it's the cyanoacrylate glue uh, made those fingerprints kind of come to life. I was thinking, where have I seen that before? Where, where the, the glue made the fingerprint like visible, and it's in uh, Beverly Hills Cop. It's he puts the super glue in the turtle tank, and that's how he gets the fingerprints off. So, <clears throat> let's see what I can do there. Okay, I am just so annoyed with myself right now because I I couldn't leave it alone. I had to take it all off. The inside of this window was... It just wasn't clean. Trying to get some of this overspray off, I started rubbing this uh, very flat matte surface of the cluster and now it's kind of shiny and I'm never going to be able to make that matte again unless I go find another cluster housing that has this untouched. But in any case, this thing was all jacked up. This little smoked window thing. And I think if I just wear gloves, hopefully this won't do that fingerprint thing again. I, I just should have left it alone, just put it back in the car and moved on. I will say one thing is this glue did a really nice job of keeping that window in place. Oh. 